welcome to the GoTo Podcast. Each episode covers the brightest and boldest ideas from the world's leading experts in software development. Tune in for practical lessons, compelling theories, and plenty of inspiration. GoTo gathers the brightest minds in the software community to help developers tackle projects today, plan for tomorrow, and create a better future. Stay up to date with the latest in tech through GoTo's top-rated events held online and in person in cities like Amsterdam, London, Copenhagen, and Chicago, and by subscribing to the GoTo Conference's YouTube channel, where you can find thousands more high-quality dev talks. Learn more at gotopia.tech. Hi, everybody. This is Bruce for GoTo, and I'm with Groxio Learning, but I have a special guest for you today. I've got Sean Moriarty, and he's the creator of the Axon Project and the co-creator of the NX Project as well. This is all things machine learning and Elixir. You want to tell the audience about yourself, Sean? Sure. So my name is Sean Moriarty, I'm originally from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, I am the author of Genetic Algorithms and Elixir, and I also have a new publication out called Machine Learning and Elixir. Um, worked in the machine learning ecosystem in Elixir for quite some time now, and I'm excited to talk a little bit about my new project. Yeah, and this is an interesting story because, as as many of you might know, Elixir has not always been known as a great language for machine learning. And so I, I think that you might have knocked Jose, the creator of Elixir, out of his chair when you wrote the first book about genetic algorithms and, and machine learning. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, I was really interested in uh, genetic algorithms and evolutionary algorithms in, in college, mainly for applications in like sports betting in particular, because um, sports betting is very similar to uh, like financial theory, investing, basically. So portfolio theory. Um, and there's a lot of tie ins with uh, using genetic algorithms and evolutionary algorithms for optimizing a portfolio for risk and reward. Um, and so I was really interested in genetic algorithms, evolutionary algorithms, and I was also really interested in Elixir, but Elixir is not a good language for doing any of this stuff. Um, the, the beam, the virtual machine that Elixir runs on, the Erlang virtual machine, is not good for uh, numerical computations. It's well suited for like concurrency, building fault tolerant applications, but numerical applications were not something that, that it was very good for. Uh, but I decided I was just gonna write uh, genetic algorithms in Elixir anyway, and so I had created a project for creating genetic algorithms and solving some toy problems, basically, with, with genetic algorithms. And I thought it was something that other people might also be interested in. So I kind of threw a Hail Mary over to the Pragmatic Programmer, the Pragmatic Bookshelf, uh, who's the publisher behind the Pragmatic Programmer, um, about a, a book pitch, basically, for genetic algorithms and Elixir. And uh, miraculously, they ended up accepting it. Um, the book came out in, I think, February of 2020, um, or maybe it might have been October of 2020. Um, and after that, uh, I got in touch with Jose Valim, who's the creator of Elixir. And he basically was like, hey, so I thought this was pretty interesting. Do you want to start working on machine learning projects in Elixir? And I thought that would be pretty awesome. So we, we started, kicked off that project around the same time, October 2020. And um, three years on now, we, we've got... Uh, everything from deep learning to traditional machine learning. Um, you can use you know, pre-trained transformers, a lot of pre-trained models uh, just directly from, from Elixir itself. And uh, our performance is pretty competitive with uh, the Python ecosystem. Um, and we have some pretty good abstractions for deploying machine learning models as well. I want to slow you down a little bit because <laughs> we've crossed over some pretty interesting things there. So, so I've got to tell you, I've got to make an admission for the first time on this podcast. I saw that initial uh, book proposal come through, and I didn't. I said this is the wrong thing for Elixir. I'm, I'm the editor, or um, kind of the line editor of the, of the Elixir line of books at the time. Um, I said this is really interesting stuff, but um, this is more interesting from an academic perspective. So I said, you know, I don't want to kill this, but I don't want to. I also don't want to uh, kind of kind of give people false hope, right? So what I did is I said, okay, this is this is interesting academically. So does anybody else want to take a shot at this? And another editor st stepped up and, and, you know, the rest is history. But one thing is interesting is that there's a, there's a pretty, pretty blinding moment in time that, that just went very quickly where 
Elixir was not a good language for for these kinds of applications to to the the time that Elixir became that. And that's what Index is about. Could you tell us a little bit about what Index does before we get into Axon and the machine learning stack? Yeah, so NX stands for Numerical Elixir, which is essentially the foundation for the Elixir machine learning ecosystem. Um, The NX project started out, so early on, we were trying to make a decision on how we were going to design the libraries. And um, Elixir and Erlang, they have this concept of native implemented functions. Uh, They're essentially just a way you can write C bindings to some, you know, native library and then get it to work with the Erlang virtual machine. Um, And one of the paths we could have taken was saying, okay, well, these libraries like TensorFlow and PyTorch, they offer C and C++ uh, libraries. We can just essentially build directly on top of that. And it would have been a pretty quick win. We could, have, we could have gotten something up and running very quickly. The problem with marrying yourself to another ecosystem is you are uh, essentially blocked anytime they have an issue. And you know, as a, as a smaller consumer of their native libraries, you might not necessarily have the biggest influence over the bugs they're going to fix and the things they're going to prioritize. So um, we made a very intentional decision to not build the library dependent on uh, other ecosystems upstream like that. Um, So NX, for those that are familiar with the Python ecosystem, is very, very similar to uh, NumPy. But NX has the additional abstraction of like pluggable compilers and backends which means that NX itself just implements a behavior, uh, which is, I guess, similar to like an abstract class for those coming from uh, object-oriented programming. Um, Essentially, it's just a contract for people to implement their own uh, implementations of some of the numerical routines that we have in NX. So for example, um, NX has something like NX.cosine or NX.cos in this case, and library uh, backend and, and compiler implementers can implement their own versions of cosine for, you know, targeted hardware um, or specialized routines uh, that are, that are, you know, accelerated in some way. And the first compiler we implemented was XLA, which is Google's uh, accelerated linear algebra. Um, It's a, it's basically a machine learning compiler for taking these numerical programs and uh, compiling them to the CPU, the GPU and and Google's TPUs, these accelerators. so NX really serves as the foundation for our entire ecosystem. It also implements automatic differentiation, which is important for implementing some of the uh, optimization routines used in Axon, which is a, a deep learning library. But it sounds like we're going to get to that a little later. Um, so that's pretty much it about NX. You know, I, I love the idea that that since you're snapping out this this whole numerical model and then, then kind of the the whole way that you think about storing Tensors, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, that that these are concepts that are just kind of ripped out of the language and snapped in, and and to make that serviceable, you did something fairly brilliant in there, and that's that's taking a um, a traditional function definition and then offering an alternative implementation. Can you tell us just just a little bit about defn? Yeah, so um, NX introduces this idea of numerical definitions, so. In Elixir, functions are declared with the def keyword. Um, in NX, uh, you get something called defn. So it's just literally like def and then an n at the end. And that's, that's a numerical definition. And these numerical definitions support a t- tiny subset of the Elixir programming language. So it's a little more strict. One of the things that we noticed, we tried to model a lot of the library off of JAX, which, uh, you know, it, it's a library. It, it offers the, basically the NumPy API, jax.numpy. Um, but, but it supports uh, just-in-time compilation. As a part of that just-in-time compilation, um, it, you get some interesting behavior. So JAX functions, uh, JAX jitted functions, they have to be uh, completely pure. So any side effects that happen, uh, they only really happen once in, in these, these programs. And you know, they have to have some interesting like static shape and type constraints. Um, and it was difficult for people transitioning to, to write JAX to get around like, hey, Python has these really flexible uh, abstractions. Like people like writing Python because it's flexible and JAXJIT was not flexible. Uh, so we made kind of an intentional decision to have a completely separate abstraction from traditional Elixir functions because we wanted people to understand that when you write a numerical definition, uh, it's gonna get JIT compiled. Um, it, you know, this, anything that's like side effecting is, is not, gonna, not gonna work very well with, with what you wanna do. 
Um, and so we wanted to keep that abstraction completely separate from the core language. Um, so when you write a numerical definition, it essentially gets immediately compiled and targeted to whatever the, the compiler you choose is. So in this case, if you're using something like EXLA, which uses Google's XLA, um, your numerical definition will get just in time compiled to uh, the CPU or the GPU, depending on the client that you choose for the, the inputs that you, that you give it. Um, and it's a very interesting abstraction because it's something that just extends the language. Like it's not, it didn't require any, any changes to Elixir upstream. Elixir itself is just a really, really flexible language with uh, metaprogramming and some of the other things you can do. Um, so we didn't have to make any changes to Elixir upstream. It's just something that we could were able to natively support given what Elixir has. Which is really beautiful, right? It's like you can you can snap these guardrails right right out to the system and and everything just works, right? So it's so I hope that the listeners are starting to get a sense that rather than building something quick and dirty and making a library type decision, this is actually something a little bit more related to the infrastructure in building up layer by layer slowly. And then let's talk a little bit about the next layer, the Axon layer. So what is Axon? Yeah, so after the NX project started to show some initial successes, we wanted to uh, get like real applications of what we were building. And so the first, I would say, real concrete application was uh, neural networks because uh, deep learning and neural networks today are almost synonymous with machine learning. People say machine learning and like 90% of the time people are talking about deep learning just because of the popularity of large language models and uh, some of these other pre-trained models for computer vision and natural language processing. Um, so while there is like traditional machine learning and we do support traditional machine learning, uh, we really targeted neural networks because at the time uh, they were very, very popular. And that was the first thing we wanted to prove we were able to do that because if we were able to do that, then we were essentially able to do anything we wanted to. Um, so Axon is a library for creating and training neural networks in Elixir. Uh, it has a very similar API to Keras, TensorFlow Keras, uh, as well as some other ideas stolen from the PyTorch ecosystem. So I am a, I would say, machine learning framework junkie, and I spend a lot of time just reading about different approaches to solving machine learning problems. and. Um, different like library design decisions that the creators of PyTorch and Keras and uh, some of the other the projects in those ecosystems have made. And, you know, looking at the complaints of people and trying out different things and seeing what works. Um, and so Axon borrows a lot of ideas from these other ecosystems to make it easy to, to create composable neural networks and then, and then also train these neural networks. And it's a fundamentally different approach than what you see in the Python ecosystem, just completely out of necessity. So, Obviously, Python supports those object-oriented abstractions, and Axon being built on top of a functional programming language has to, to build on functional constructs. So um, it's a little difficult in, in terms of like comparing apples to apples, you know, something that's implemented in Keras and something that's implemented in Axon. Um, but it is very similar, it will feel very similar to someone coming from another, another ecosystem directly into the Elixir ecosystem. Yeah, and this is this is cool, right? So one of the things that I've noticed is that by slowing down, <laughs> we're, we're kind of hitting we're hitting this point where everything seems to be happening at once. It seems seems like having the Elixir infrastructure underneath um, by slowing down and getting the abstractions right, all those things can be brought to bear to the overall to the overall project. So can you talk about the impact of Axon and Index on the Elixir ecosystem? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, first I want to hit on the point that like starting out slowly, how, how fundamentally important that was to what we wanted to do, because um, you, I think there, this is happening a lot in the Python ecosystem now. Um, PyTorch, PyTorch 2.0 has made a huge like effort to rewrite a lot of their internals in Python. And there's a lot of reason for that decision. Um, but, you know, one of them is obviously just like from a maintainability perspective, um, Python for better or worse, is, is much more approachable than C++ as like a, you know, language for writing compilers um, and, and writing for, for someone who's, you know, just coming into uh, the PyTorch ecosystem, it's a lot easier for them to just look at some Python code that maybe implements like their, their, some of their, their backends for, for writing these, uh, these numerical programs, uh, then trying to figure out like decipher C++. And so we had that kind of same inclination from the beginning that 
we should keep as much of what we were building in Elixir as possible because it's more maintainable, it's more approachable, um, and it was going to just be easier for us to, to work with and to work fast and build on top of um, because neither myself nor Jose nor any of the uh, maintainers who have come on after the fact of the original project like uh, Paolo and Jonathan, um, none of none of us are, are C++ people. We all are Elixir programmers. And so um, keeping everything in Elixir allows us to work a lot faster than we traditionally would have because we're, you know, we're a very small team of people writing this. It's, it's basically four or five people that are that are really the core maintainers of the NX project. And um, we're able to implement features significantly faster just because we're working in Elixir and, you know, only reach into C++ and C and Rust and whatever uh, when it's absolutely necessary. Um, now, the overall impact that NX and Axon have had on the uh, Elixir ecosystem I would say it, it's it's been pretty large, um, especially in the amount of time that the, the projects have, have been out there. So we really are only around three years into these projects, and um, there are already some successful applications of these libraries being used in production. Um, people, I think, are excited about the prospect of using machine learning in Elixir, especially for companies that are using um, Elixir for their actual like deployment environment, and their uh, backend services and stuff. Uh, it's a lot I would say easier for someone like them to maybe get thrown a model from the Python ecosystem from their data science or machine learning team, uh, and then to implement, you know, essentially an inference pipeline um, directly in Elixir without having to uh, call out to another service or, or, or build some on top of some complex like microservices stack. So it has definitely had a pretty large impact, um, and I'm excited to see where the, the ecosystem grows. Yeah, we're starting to see all these little little pop up projects, right? And that's that's all always an indication that that you're doing something well on the abstractions end, right? Um, so we've talked a little bit about the impact of machine learning on Elixir and the idea that this is unexpected and and pretty exciting and is has definitely hit this critical mass where everything is rolling now. But we haven't talked about the impact that we might see of introducing Elixir to machine learning. Can you talk about why that might be interesting to us? Yeah, so anytime you try to, I guess, like penetrate a, a, an additional market from a programming language perspective, you have to, I, I would say, like do it carefully and, and think hard about why someone would choose to use your language for uh, whatever it is that they're doing over what they're used to. Um, and particularly like in machine learning, Python is so entrenched and it's for good reason. There's a lot of really great abstractions and great libraries in the Python ecosystem. Um, it's friendly for, you know, beginner programmers who might have like, you know, an academic background and they're interested in some aspect of like numerical computing or machine learning. Um, it's very easy to write, you know, pick up Python and just, and just run with it. Um, so when we first started these projects, I think a lot of people thought we were kind of crazy because, you know, it, trying to target something that is so entrenched like Python is in the machine learning ecosystem, you know, other languages have tried to do this and uh, it doesn't always have the best results. And so uh, we, we were trying to, I guess, tread carefully from the very beginning that, uh, you know, we, we don't necessarily see these projects as overtaking Python as the, like the primary language for machine learning. Uh, but we wanted to give people who were using Elixir and who were interested also in Elixir kind of an alternative to some of their original workflows. And as the projects have matured, we're kind of identifying areas where our projects could have a significant advantage over uh, some of the same projects in the Python ecosystem. So I think one of those is in our serving abstraction, which is a uh, servings in, in the world of machine learning are just like an inference. Uh, it's It's essentially just a fancy way to say that we're, we're going to get uh, inferences from the model in production. And in the Python ecosystem, there are like five or six serving projects and they're all separate services like Torch Serve, TensorFlow Serving, uh, KServe, which is like a Kubernetes thing. Um, there, there's these all these abstractions for essentially overcoming, I think, some of the shortcomings that Python has as a, as a language for uh, deploying machine learning infrastructure. Whereas in the Elixir ecosystem, we don't necessarily have some of the same shortcomings. So uh, we have this abstraction, which is NX serving. It is essentially a, a, a data structure or a behavior that wraps uh, 
what you would see in, in a production inference pipeline. So it encapsulates pre-processing, actual inference of the model, and then post-processing. And the NX serving abstraction is very, very simple, but it supports some pretty insane things. Like because of the the, the way Elixir is built on top of the Erlang virtual machine, um, NX serving supports distribution just natively. So if you have a cluster, um, you can spin up, you know, multiple servings and they're, they're load balanced automatically between the, the nodes in your cluster. Or if you have, let's say like multiple GPUs, you can partition inferences between, uh, multiple GPUs. And it's a very scalable, uh, application. It's a very, it's a very scalable abstraction. And it's also gets, you get all of the, the goodies that you would get from building on top of the airline virtual machine to begin with, like, you know, fault tolerance and, and, uh, good concurrency and, 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 you know, the ability to build robust machine learning applications uh, on a, on a battle tested and, and production ready uh, virtual machine. So it sounds kind of like there are reasons to use Elixir and there are reasons to do machine learning. And, and so the, the reasons to, to use Elixir don't go away just because you're entering this other space. Right. So in, in some ways, uh, all the things that Elixir does are becoming table stakes, right? And all the things that machine learning does are becoming table stakes. And so once, once we can bring those two things together, some pretty exciting things happen. Exactly. Yeah. And we try as best as we possibly can to make the ecosystem, uh, you know, interop well with the Python ecosystem. So we have this library called Bumblebee, which supports a lot of pre-trained, uh, machine learning models in the, in the, Python ecosystem. So essentially what Bumblebee is, is it's very similar to the Hugging Face Transformers library, uh, which has a ton of pre-trained transformer models and some other like uh, computer vision based models like ResNet and, and whatnot. And um, we built Bumblebee as kind of like an intermediary between ourselves and the Python ecosystem. So we're able to take uh, pre-trained like PyTorch models, um, convert them to what you would need to use in Elixir, and then use them directly in your Elixir applications. And we also support a lot of the same uh, tasks as you could you would see in the Python ecosystem. So Hugging Face has like pipelines is what they call them. We call them servings. Uh, these pipelines support anything from theme identity recognition to text classification to image classification to text generation. We support all those as well. So um, if you are working with a data science team that, you know, they're not going to want to switch right away from using, you know, Elixir or from using Python to Elixir. So they can still work in, in Python. They train their models in Python and then uh, as long as you have like trained or saved weights, uh, you can kind of throw them over to your your uh, backend team, and they can they can write the inference pipeline in Elixir. So we're we're very intentionally, I think, uh, you know, friendly or try to be friendly and supportive of the Python ecosystem because you know in some ways it's it's a necessity. There's no reason to uh, completely uh, disregard all of the incredible work that's been done in the Python ecosystem because um, it's just unrealistic to think that we would be able to. Uh, catch up with 30 plus years of, of a head start in the space, right? Um, so we, we try to try to support interop. We also support um, Onyx, Open Neural Network Exchange, so you can transfer or you can uh, you can essentially take uh, Onyx models that you've trained, in, you know, in the Python ecosystem, and uh, run them with some of the NX abstractions. So we have what's called like a storage only backend, where you use the NX serving abstraction as a way to implement an inference pipeline and it's backed by the Onyx runtime. So um, there's there's a lot of reasons to, uh, you know, use Elixir without actually having to switch from using Python. Yeah, can we talk about some of the use cases that you might have seen in Bumblebee? Uh, what, what can this thing do and where, well, first let's talk about what it can do. Yeah, so Bumblebee can do a lot of the same things that the Hugging Face Transformers library can do. So we support um, a pretty large, I would say, relative to to uh, the size of the Transformers library, we have a pretty pretty large coverage of of the pre-trained models, at least the ones that uh, are the most popular. So you could take something like a pre-trained BERT and you know do uh, do text classification with that. You can fine tune the models and you know pre-trained models from Bumblebee for downstream applications. Um, we also support, like I said, these serving. So. Um, one example that I've seen used is, is in entity recognition, um, taking, uh, essentially extracting like proper nouns out of some structured or unstructured data like text, uh, and identifying like, Hey, this is a person, this is a place, this is, uh, you know, an organization. Um, and then we also support like text generation. So we do support some of the, uh, 
latest and greatest uh, chat models out there. So Llama, for example, is one of the ones that we do support. Um, you can build on large language models in Elixir without having to actually, you know, shell out to Python or something else. So uh, there are a lot of very powerful applications. And one of the strengths of Bumblebee is that it's a very low code, I would say, library. So, you know, getting up and running with a text generation pipeline is probably like four lines of code and, and you're ready to go. Um, and that's pretty powerful, especially for us, because in the Elixir ecosystem, we don't have a ton of people with machine learning experience. So Bumblebee is able to, to give them access to like a quick win. You know, I've talked to a number of people who have started to make some Bumblebee contributions. They said it's it's really remarkably easy. So it seems like once again, the abstractions are are good. Yep. And Bumblebee builds, it's, it's an 100% Elixir library. So really the only libraries we have that touch any sort of native code are, are you know, compilers for NX. Um, NX itself is a 100% Elixir library, and then it's the compilers that NX touches that are written in C and C++ and Rust and uh, some of the other native languages. But uh, everything from NX to Axon to Bumblebee, it's 100% Elixir. So it's a very approachable library. Um, the abstractions are, are very, I think, easy to understand once you kind of peel back the layers. So uh, it's very powerful. So we've spent a little bit of time embracing Python, and I'm not going to say take your shot now, but what are some of the things that Elixir does that may make it maybe even better for machine learning than some of the other machine learning languages? Yeah, I think the obvious one here is concurrency. Um, Python with with the uh, the the gil is is it's kind of difficult to achieve the same, I would say, level of uh, concurrency that you you can achieve in an Elixir application. Elixir is really, really good for building like robust, uh, fault tolerant, concurrent, highly concurrent applications. Um, one of the things that originally drew me to uh, trying to do machine learning in Elixir was uh, there's a book from the Pragmatic Bookshelf as well, Concurrent Data Processing in Elixir. And it's about building these like robust uh uh, data pipelines, highly concurrent data pipelines. And uh, that's something that you see a lot in machine learning workloads and uh, achieving some of the, the the same, I guess, throughput that you would you would get in the, the Python ecosystem, the Elixir ecosystem is just trivial. Um, there's a lot of like abstractions in the Python ecosystem that are essentially just like wrappers around C and C++ uh, implementations, whereas, uh, you, you know, you don't have to do the same thing in, in the Elixir ecosystem. So for example, like, tf.data is is a data input pipeline uh, for for uh, tensorflow and the same exact things you can do in tf.data you can just do natively with elixir because it just supports this you know concurrent data processing out of the box um, and then a lot of the the like the you know otp abstractions in elixir are uh, i would say very very well suited for building these like robust machine learning applications so I'm just now because I, you know, I was not getting into the language. I liked Elixir aesthetically, uh, but I didn't necessarily appreciate the OTP abstractions as much. And now recently I'm starting to get really into the, to the uh, OTP abstractions and, and building more on uh, what the language is designed to do and seeing how, how it, you know, connects really well with uh, some of the things you want to do in like the ML ops lifecycle, which is, you know, the lifecycle for deploying machine learning models and um, trying to identify, I guess, use cases for, uh, Oh, this is like you know really powerful, and this is how this benefits the machine learning ecosystem. So uh, there's a lot of things that I think Elixir does better than Python, just out of you know the circumstances of the language. The language is designed for uh, telecom platforms, right, or build on top of a language designed for telecom platforms. And uh, it turns out those abstractions are also really good for building like robust web applications. And so um, that's one thing, or those are some of the things I think that Elixir does just better than Python as a consequence of of how it's built. And what about immutability? Does that does that play a role, or does the lack of immutability play a role in the way that you've had to to build axon and layers versus the way you might have done it with something like Python? Yeah, I think immutability is an interesting one because um, for like mathematicians and people who are coming from like an academic machine learning background, uh, the immutability and like the functional style of writing things in Elixir kind of fits better with what. Uh, you know, you would be used to seeing like mathematically. Um, immutability, I think, helps a lot about, you know, reasoning about some of these uh, more complex, uh, highly concurrent uh, data pipelines. But then from like just the, the I guess, aesthetic perspective, uh, writing a 
program, a, a numerical program functionally, I think makes a lot more sense than uh, some of the, the things you would do in the Python ecosystem. So like, for example, like um, TensorFlow and PyTorch both support what are called in-place operations, where essentially you have a buffer that's, uh, you have a tensor that's backed by some buffer and you can perform like an in-place sort where that data is is completely changed, completely overwritten. Um, and I've had you know experiences in the in the Python ecosystem where I do something in place, and then um, you you get some pretty wonky results because you don't realize that you were mutating some data like four or five lines up, or you know somewhere at the beginning of the program. Uh, you don't necessarily have that same exact problem in the Elixir ecosystem because everything is immutable that by default. So um, it, from a performance perspective, it's something that kind of hindered Elixir from from, from the beginning because. Uh, with immutability, that obviously like kind of implies some additional copies, but with this comp compiler, this JIT compilation concept that we introduced with NX, uh, we kind of completely bypass any of the issues we have with immutability because um, NX works on like a multi-staged programming model. So when you write a numerical definition, uh, it gets lowered to an NX expression, and then that gets compiled into a program. So it's not eager by default. It's it's a very you know uh, I would say static workflow, and so uh, you don't necessarily have the same performance hits with immutability that you would if you were just you know uh, working natively in Elixir. You just kind of carve down how much what what your primitive operations are, right? You expand those a little bit and mm -hmm. and and contract them in other places, right? And that's that's pretty cool. Yeah. So. I have a couple more questions for you. Do you have some favorite moments on um, of of when you know this whole roller of where this whole roller coaster ride has taken you? Uh, are there some favorite moments? Yeah, there's definitely a lot of like uh, stories related to these projects. Um, early on, I don't think we like there was a lot of I would say initial roadblocks to to success, and like we 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 have come a long way. But in the beginning, it was there was not like a guarantee that the projects were going to work out. It was kind of just more of an experiment. So. I can distinctly remember some of the initial like trials and tribulations with these projects. One, for example, was uh, the first time we got NX and to like to compile a program to the GPU. Um, that was a little rough. So there, I have I go into a deep dive on on Twitter about this, but uh, the the Erlang virtual machine does some interesting things like intentionally and. Uh, when you're dealing with uh, subprocesses, external programs, um, you can run into some problems. So I, I have a deep dive on Twitter about that, but I, I, I do distinctly remember it took like a few days to track down some issues we were having with, you know, why could we not compile a program to the GPU? And then uh, we had kind of a breakthrough moment. We're able to, and I think it was the program we were compiling it was just like one plus one or something simple. Like it was nothing, nothing crazy, but uh, that was that was pretty awesome when that first happened. And then um, I remember we had some initial uh, difficulties with. Um, uh, uh, autograd. So, uh, Jose wrote a lot of the, uh, autograd like infrastructure. I think he honestly has probably rewritten it like six or seven times, uh, in, you know, the life of the project. And, uh, I remember how, just how frustrating it was at times to, to get some of the things to work because, uh, autograd is not necessarily or automatic differentiation is not necessarily something that's like straightforward to implement, uh, and straightforward to implement efficiently. Um, so I, I remember the first neural network we trained when we finally got, uh, you know, the automatic differentiation system working. And we had written a, a pure NX neural network. Uh, it was just trained on MNIST. And I remember that I think that was like maybe six or seven months into the project when that, that first worked. And that was, that was pretty awesome. Um, and then we also, some of the first benchmarks we had were, you know, we showed that the GPU compiled program with uh, NX and EXLA were like 4,000 times faster than anything you can do uh, natively in Elixir and sharing some of those benchmarks and people were like, this is crazy. That's, I can't believe this is happening. Um, that was a lot of fun too. Yeah. With the Koi messaging, you know, this thing that we're working on is X percent faster. You know, that was kind of a lot of fun to watch too. Yep. <laughs> and, and what about, what about some, some moments that, um, that were particularly like frustrating for you? Um, what would have been some of the hard ones to break through? You mentioned, you mentioned the the earlier one with with kind of establishing that that initial compilation, but what were some of the other ones that were pretty difficult? Yeah, so um, the GPU one in particular, I just remember being incredibly frustrating. So I guess like high level, essentially, what was going on there is that 
to compile a, a, a program to uh, the GPU, uh, specifically NVIDIA GPUs, uh, TensorFlow and XLA were using something called PTX, which is like a uh, NVIDIA assembler, essentially. Um, and they were calling it out from a subprocess using, I think, like uh, weight PID or something, something particular. Um, and there's like something where on Linux systems, the uh, airline virtual machine sets SIG child to, uh, I think, SIG ignore or something specific, which essentially just results in, in uh, the, the calling process of, of weight PID to completely like ignore the result of the program and return negative one or something insane. And, and like tracking that down took forever. Like that, and that's something that's, that's pretty obscure about the, the airline, you know, virtual machine that like only a few people would know off the bat. Right. Um, there was another very frustrating, uh, segmentation fault we were getting with, uh, convolutions on NVIDIA GPUs. And I remember just how frustrating it was kind of working with NVIDIA and trying to figure out what the deal was. And it turned out actually the, the reason for the segmentation fault was the default stack size for, uh, uh, the, the dirty NIFs that we were using, which is kind of a, it's an air or an elixir specific thing that the, uh, the dirty NIFs were using the, the default stack size was too small. Um, and I had talked to some of the core team, uh, for Erlang a few times about this and they kept saying, well, if you just set the stack size a little bigger, does it work? And I was like, yeah, I've tried that. It doesn't work, but I was setting the flag wrong or something. So it took me like four or five months to realize that I was setting the flag wrong. And I think NVIDIA had been telling me the same thing too. They were like, well, what's the stack size? Like, is the stack size too small? Um, so that was frustrating, but that was probably more frustrating for me to realize, you know, that I was making a silly mistake. It was like a typo or something that, that, uh, and you know how frustrating it can be when you realize that, you know, and you have a typo in your code that's been contributing to a bug for like four or five months now. Um, that was frustrating. And there've been some, I guess, difficult moments in, in, uh, implementing like Axon. So, um, I think we have the benefit of, of being able to test against correct implementations in PyTorch and TensorFlow, but when you're implementing like numerical algorithms, uh, getting exact like correctness, numerical correctness is very, very difficult. Like it very, there's can be very subtle bugs that just pop up and uh, they have a drastic impact on the stability of like training different models and the predictions you get with different models. And so uh, that can be very frustrating as well. Um, I remember we implemented, so one of the things you can do with Bumblebee is stable diffusion. You can do image generation. And I just remember working for like two weeks straight, trying to get, uh, the outputs we were getting from stable diffusion to match, match, like within a very small precision of, of what you get in Python. And I, I also remember like thinking how it, insane or how, you know, how, how, how much admiration I have for people that are implement these algorithms from scratch without any reference implementation and without any, uh, any, any reference tests or anything to say like, you know, this is the correct implementation of whatever this uh, algorithm is. So uh, those are always very frustrating to try to track down those small bugs and numerical correctness. So I have two, two more questions that are basically wrap up questions. One of them is uh, make your last pitch for machine learning with Elixir. Yeah, so for I think those that are uh, deploying, um, well, first, I, I honestly think that Elixir for machine learning startups is probably the best language that you can have because you can do everything in Elixir um, and not just everything from like a machine learning perspective, but also like from a like application development perspective. So um, with Live View, you can, you know, write your front end in Elixir with uh, uh, Phoenix. You can write really scalable backends with Elixir. Um, you can have your entire, you know, inference pipeline written in Elixir and it's, it's fault tolerant and scalable. Uh, you can train your models in Elixir. You can deploy your models in Elixir. And I think for a startup that's, you know, undermanned or, or, you know, not necessarily, doesn't necessarily have large teams, you can build at a, a very high velocity. And I think that's something that you just don't necessarily get from another ecosystem. So if I was a small team, that, that is obvious. I think that would, that would, uh, be the first language I would, I would reach for would be, you know building an application in Elixir because you can punch above your weight. I like that. So you take JavaScript off the table, you take Python off the table and you, you centralize everything on one language. That's, that's wonderful. And I have one last question. Is there anything else that you want your listeners to know uh, what's coming up, what's happening? Yeah. So um, I guess on, on, we, we've kind of ranted a little bit about machine learning and Elixir, but I definitely want my, my, 
uh, the listeners to know if you're if you're not familiar with the machine learning and Elixir ecosystem, we have I think the perfect uh, treat for you. So I just recently released a book, Machine Learning in Elixir. Uh, it's out in beta now, where you can learn the fundamentals of the machine learning ecosystem uh, in Elixir from the ground up. So if you are not familiar with Elixir, you can. It's a great way to learn the language. And then if you are familiar with Elixir and you're not familiar with machine learning, then it's a great way to learn machine learning. Um, machine learning in Elixir is. I would say it's designed to be the authoritative source on everything you can do with machine learning in Elixir. Um, and it's got a lot of inspiration from some of my favorite uh, machine learning books, such as, uh, you know, Francois Cholet's uh, Deep Learning in Python was kind of the, the first book I ever read in, in machine learning. And then um, some of the other really popular machine learning textbooks out there, like Deep Learning uh, by Ian Goodfellow and Yoshio Bengio and uh, the other co-authors they have there. So um, I would highly recommend any listeners of these to go check out that book. Um, send me any errata you find because it is in beta. So we're, obviously there's going to be some issues as we upgrade the libraries and, and things change. But um, yeah, that's, I think that's, that's really the, one of my key focuses now is just building out some of the educational material for uh, people in the ecosystem to, to kind of, you know, cut their teeth on. Wonderful. That's a beautiful cap going from genetic algorithms all the way to machine learning and Elixir. And uh, so for Bruce and Sean, We've been talking for the GoTo Book Club, and we're signing off. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for listening to this episode of the GoTo Podcast. Head over to gotopia.tech to discover lots more content from the brightest minds in software development. Mm-hmm.